Report from Iron Mountain on the Possibility and Desirability of Peace with Introductory Material by Leonard C. Lewin The Dial Press, Incorporated, 1967, New York Library of Congress car, Catalog Card Number 6727553 Printed in the U.S. John Doe, as I will call him in this book, for reasons that will be made clear, is a professor at a large university in the Middle West. His field is one of social sciences, but I will not identify him beyond this. He telephoned me on one evening last winter, quite unexpectedly. We had not been in touch for several years. He was in New York for a few days, he said, and there was something important he wanted to discuss with me. He wouldn't say what it was. We met for lunch the next day at a midtown restaurant. He was obviously disturbed. He made small talk for half an hour, which was quite out of character, and I didn't press him. Then, apropos of nothing, he mentioned a dispute between a writer and a prominent political family that had been in the headlines. What, he wanted to know, were my views on freedom of information? How would I qualify them? and so on. My answers were not memorable, but they seemed to satisfy him. Then quite abruptly he began to tell me the following story. Early in August of 1963, he said, he found a message on his desk that a Mrs. Potts had called him from Washington. When he returned the call, a man answered immediately and told Doe, among other things, they had been selected to serve on a commission of the highest importance. Its objective was to determine, accurately and realistically, the nature of the problems that would confront the United States if and when a condition of permanent peace should arrive, and to draft a program for dealing with this contingency. The man described the unique procedures that were to govern the commission's work and that were expected to extend its scope far beyond that of any previous examination of these problems. Considering that the caller did not precisely identify either himself or his agency, his persuasiveness must have been truly remarkable order. Doe entertained no serious doubts of the bona fides of the project. However, chiefly because of his previous experience with the excessive secrecy that often surrounds quasi-governmental activities. In addition, the man at the other end of the line demonstrated an impressively complete and surprisingly detailed knowledge of Doe's work and personal life. He also mentioned the names of others who were to serve with the group. Most of them were known to Doe by reputation. Doe agreed to take the assignment. He felt he had no real choice in the matter and to appear the second Saturday, following at Iron Mountain, New York. An airline ticket arrived in his mail the next morning. The cloak-and-dagger tone of this convocation was further enhanced by the meeting place itself. Iron Mountain, located near the town of Hudson, is like something out of Ian Fleming or E. Phillips Oppenheim. It is an underground nuclear hideout for hundreds of large American corporations. Most of them use it as an emergency storage vault for important documents, but a number of them maintain substitute corporate headquarters as well, where essential personnel could presumably survive and continue to work after an attack. This later group includes such firms as Standard Oil of New Jersey, Manufacturers Hanover Trust, and Shell. I will leave most of the story of the operations of the Special Study Group, as the Commission was formally called, for Doe to tell in his own words. This is background information. At this point it is necessary to say only that it met and worked regularly for over two and a half years, after which it produced a report. It was this document, and what to do about it, that Doe wanted to talk to me about. The report, he had said, had been suppressed both by the Special Study Group itself and by the Government Interagency Committee to which it had been submitted. After months of agonizing, Doa decided that he would no longer be party to keeping it secret. 
What he wanted from me was advice and assistance in having it published. He gave me his copy to read, with the express understanding that if for any reason I were unwilling to become involved, I would say nothing about it to anyone else. I read the report that same night. I will pass over my own reactions to it, except to say that the unwillingness of Doe's associates to publicize their findings became readily understandable. What had happened was that they had been so tenacious in their determination to deal comprehensively with the many problems of transition to peace that the original question asked of them were never quite answered. Instead, this is what they concluded. Lasting peace, while not theoretically impossible, is probably unattainable. Even if it could be achieved, it would almost certainly not be in the best interests of a stable society to achieve it. That is the gist of what they say. Behind their qualified academic language runs this general argument. War fills certain functions essential to the stability of our society. Until other ways of fulfilling them are developed, the war system must be detained, and improved on its effectiveness. It is not surprising that the group, in its letter of transmittal, did not choose to justify its work to the lay reader, unexposed to the exigencies of higher political or military responsibility. Its report was addressed, deliberately, to unnamed government administrators of high rank. It assumed considerable political sophistication from this select audience. To the general reader, therefore, the substance of the document may be even more unsettling than its conclusions. He may not be prepared for some of its assumptions. For instance, that most medical advances are viewed more as problems than as progress, or that poverty is necessary and desirable, public postures by politicians to the contrary notwithstanding, or that standing armies are, among other things, social welfare institutions in which the same sense as are old people's homes and mental hospitals. It may strike him as odd to find the probable explanation of flying saucer incidents disposed of in passant in less than a sentence. He may be less surprised to find that the space program and the controversial anti-missile missile and fallout shelter programs are understood to have the spending of vast sums of money, not the advancement of science or national defense as their principal goals, and to learn that military draft policies are only remotely concerned with defense. He may be offended to find the organized repression of minority groups, and even the re-establishment of slavery, seriously and on the whole favorably discussed as possible aspects of a world of peace, he is not likely to take kindly to the notium of the deliberate intensification of air and water pure pollution as part of a program leading to peace. Even when the reason for considering it is made clear. That a world without war will have to turn sooner rather than later to universal tests to procreation will be less disturbing if no more appealing. But few readers will not be taken aback, at least, by a few lines in the report's conclusions, repeated in its formal recommendations, that suggest that the long-range plannings and budgeting of the optimum members of lives to be destroyed annually in overt warfare is high on the group's list of priorities for governmental action. I cite these few examples primarily to warn the general reader what he can expect. The statesmen and strategists for these eyes the report was intended obviously need no such protective admonition. This book, of course, is evidence of my response to Doe's request. After carefully considering the problems that might confront the publisher of the report, we took it to the Dial Press. There, its significance was immediately recognized, and, more important, we were given firm assurances that no outside pressures of any sort would be permitted to interfere with its publication. 
It should be made clear that Doe does not disagree with the substance of the report, which represents his genuine consensus in all important respects. He constituted a minority of one, but only on the issue of disclosing it to the general public. A look at how the group dealt with this question will be illuminating. The debate took place at the group's last full meeting before the report was written, late in March 1966, and again at Iron Mountain. Two facts must be kept in mind by way of background. The first is that the special study group had never been explicitly charged with or sworn to secrecy, either when it was convened or at any time thereafter. The second is that the group had nevertheless operated as if it had been. This was assumed from the circumstances of its inception and from the tone of its instructions. The group's acknowledgment of help from the many persons who contributed so greatly to our work is somewhat equivocal. These persons were not told the nature of the project for which their special resources of information were solicited. Those who argued the case for keeping the report secret were admittedly motivated by fear of the explosive political effects that could be expected from publicity. For evidence, they pointed to the suppression of the far less controversial report of then-Senator Hubert Humphrey's subcommittee on disarmament in 1962. Subcommittee members had reportedly feared that it might be used by communist propagandists, as Stener Senator Stuart Symington put it to back up the Marxist theory that was production was the reason for the success of capitalism. Similar political precautions had been taken with the better known Gaither Report in 1957, and even the so-called Myhanian Report in 1965. Furthermore, they insisted, a distinction must be made between serious studies, which are normally classified unless and until policymakers decide to release them and conventional showcase projects, organized to demonstrate a political leadership's concerns about an issue and to deflect the energy of those pressing for action on it. The example used became some of the group had participated in it was a White House conference on intended cooperation disarmament, which had been late staged in 1965 to offset all of the complaints about escalation of the Vietnam War. Doe acknowledged this distinction, as well as the strong possibility of public misunderstanding, but he feels that if the sponsoring agency had wanted to mandate secrecy, it could have done so at the outset. It could also have assigned the project to one of the government's established think tanks, which normally work on a classified basis. He scoffed at fear of public reaction, which could have no lasting effect on long-range measures that might be taken to implement the group's proposals, and derided the group's abdication of responsibility for its opinions and conclusions. So far as he was concerned, there was such a thing as a public right to know what was being done on its own behalf. The burden of proof was on those who would abridge it. If my account seems to give Doe the better of the argument, despite his failure to convince his colleagues, well, so be it. My participation in this book testifies that I am not neutral. In my opinion, the decision of the special study group to censor its own findings was not merely timid, but presumptuous. But the refusal, as of this writing, of the agencies of which the report was prepared to release, it themselves raises broader questions of public policy. Such questions center on the continuing use of self-serve definitions of security to avoid possible political embarrassment. It is ironic how often this practice backfires. I should state, for the record, that I do not share the attitudes toward war and peace and life and death and survival of the species that is manifested in the report. Few readers will. In human terms, it is an outrageous document, but it does represent a serious and challenging effort to define an enormous problem, and it explains, or certainly appears to explain, aspects of American policy otherwise incomprehensible by the ordinary standards of common sense. What we may think of these explanations is something else. 
But it seems to me that we are entitled to know not only what they are, but whose they are. By whose I do not merely the names of the authors of the report, but much more important, we have a right to know what extent their assumptions of social necessity are shared by the decision makers in our government. Which do they accept and which do they reject? However disturbing the answers, only full and frank discussion offers any conceivable hope of solving the problems raised by the special study group in their report from Iron Mountain.